All right, everybody, I think we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with our session here today. Uh, welcome to CARE Oregon's MedZed. This particular one here focusing today on a very, very specific way of looking at diabetes as a condition and getting some tangible options to make treatment of diabetes better and easier and more consistent for our patient population. Here are the typical uh, metrics that most of us are having to deal with in terms of diabetes. If you need a little reminder on those things here, and I think we're going to be giving some real specific practical tools today to help us tackle those metrics and make things a little bit easier for our folks. I would say uh, these are the, the primary learning objectives that we're going to be uh, putting out there for you here today, but we're certainly going to be going beyond those three as well when you see the direction that we're going. So if you have any questions, we've got probably the best experts that you can get on the subject here today. And we want to be able to jump in there, like I said, right away and make sure to start giving you this good content. So to begin with this morning, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Andrew Amman. He is professor of medicine and an endocrinologist and director of the Harold Schnitzer Diabetes Center. If you look him up, he is on the National Board of Medical Examiners, the American Board of Internal Medicine. Uh, he has written more papers than you could possibly imagine looking at his CV. I think the one that jumped out as me is my favorite, though, is can trained dogs detect a hypoglycemic scent in patients with type 1 diabetes? That title is fantastic. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Andrew Ahmad. Thank you. Okay, so what's the answer? Can trained dogs sense glucose? How often? <laughs> so they were right 12% of the time. So they can certainly do it, but there doesn't, you wouldn't want to depend on that as your only way of telling what a blood sugar was. So. Uh, but, the, but the people who own them are convinced they're great, and I think get a lot of other good from them. So we're not recommending against dogs, but some people are paying $30,000 to get a trained dog, so that part gets it plays into this. But our discussion is going to be on, I mean, I think, I think it's open. There's too many patients who have really poor control. And so the main goal of this, of this effort, as I understand it, is to try and at least get as many people as possible down below 9%, because there's way too many people over 9%. And I think what, we'll, what one of the points being that we always talk about our goals, What's the most often stated goal for an A1C? About 7%. But remember, if you get a 1% reduction in A1C, that's a lot of benefit for a patient. If you get patients down from 10 to, to 9 or 8, that's a lot of improvement. You don't have to feel like you failed because you didn't get to 7. And, uh, and I think that that's relevant. So uh, this is something that I think you're all familiar with. So. I don't really intend to, uh, to belabor the points, except that this is all new, this uh, is new data that just came up uh, as of January of this year. The uh, CDC, every several years, comes out with new statistics that they produce this diabetes paper. So you can go on cdc.gov and get this information pretty easily. But they're saying there's now about 30.1 million individuals with diabetes. Type 2 is really 90 to 95% of all of this. Uh, these are old cost statistics, but obviously really significant. But 12% of patient of people over the age of 18 have diabetes, and if you go to patients over the age of 60 or people over the age of 65, it's up to 25%. And then there's this big number that also have prediabetes, which is an important issue that we would like to see more progress in in Oregon. Uh, and then finally, this is a statistic that's a little older now, but. It's a scary thought that by the year 2050, we're going to end up uh, with about a third of our males and even more of that percentage of our females having diabetes. So there are some basic, principle, uh, teach, uh, basic uh, treatment principles uh, that include patient education, and I think it's the one we forget about the most often. Uh, even in our center, I think we don't use our educators often enough. But whether it's nutritionists or whether it's somebody just giving, reminding them of the basics, it's so important. And it's not just the one time that they get diagnosed, but it's at every critical juncture that you should be considering sending them back. It's amazing how many patients even in our clinic go on for a long time and one day you say, 
well, you, so how long do you inject your insulin before your meal? And you say, oh, I never inject it before the meal, I inject it after the meal. But those sorts of things keep slipping through. They don't think about them enough. They, they forget what, uh, what they were supposed to do about it. Uh, glucose monitoring is individualized. So we think one of the problems that occurred was in the years past, there were too many people saying, oh, you needed to check two times a day, three times a day, four times a day. But it was ridiculous because some of the people who were, a lot of the people checking four times a day were people who didn't need to check at all. And the people who needed to check more frequently were rarely checking because they didn't quite understand the significance of it. So I think that this ranges greatly depending on the patients. If you have a patient who's in pretty good control, is not on an agent that causes hypoglycemia, you technically rarely need to have them monitor. Uh, I will also say that I was at a HERC meeting a few years ago and someone piped up in, as we were going through the process of how many strips people should get uh, in, under Medicaid, and, and we had them convinced, I thought, that they should give it at least what the Medicare guidelines were for giving strips. And suddenly somebody spoke up and say, well, I practice primary care and I never look at the blood sugars. And that's a problem. We get, I had a patient come in yesterday who said, oh yeah, I used to check, but I brought in my sheet of all my blood sugars and my doc would never look at it. And so, you know, they're not going, if they don't see that other people think or their providers don't think it's important, they're not going to think it's important. But it's a good guide. Exercise, I think, is pretty well known uh, that 150 minutes per week has become sort of popularized. Diet, there is no specific diet. You can't say it's an ADA diet any longer. It's just a healthy diet. We don't really propose that people would eat really low carb diets uh, because it's hard to sustain, uh, but rather that uh, they have balanced diets and they use a lot of whole grains, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, and so forth. And then comes to pharmacologic therapy that we're really going to be talking about the most here. This is just a natural history of type 2 diabetes and it's pretty complicated, but I want to remind you of a few things. And this would basically say that if you took from the time, the decades before this all started, that people, this is the orange one, insulin starts going up and up and up because you're, a lot of these patients are insulin resistance, uh, resistant and they keep making more insulin to compensate, but they get to a point where they can't compensate and that's when they basically get diabetes. And I, it looks like one of the lines dropped here because there's supposed to be a line here that says diagnosis of diabetes. But, uh, and you can see the insulin resistance goes up but then actually plateaus and hepatic glucose production doesn't really start until somebody gets diabetes. But the important thing to really look at here is the fact that after you get to that peak where you've tried to, your pancreas tried to compensate producing as much insulin as it could, once it gets past that point, from there on it keeps going down. And that's why we need one therapy and then a second therapy and then a third therapy frequently to get people to go. It's also important to note here that you see this would be pre-diabetes. And you actually, one of the important things, differences is that with pre-diabetes, you already see increase in macrovascular disease or coronary artery disease and so forth. And really, uh, diabetes is defined by microvascular complications. So why did they choose a blood glucose of 126? It was because in three huge populations, they found that somewhere between 120 and 130 for fasting glucose, you would start to see people who have diabetic retinopathy. And so it wasn't very much, but it was like no retinopathy, no retinopathy, whoop, a blip, a significant blip that showed you were actually having people with a complication of diabetes, and that's what they called diabetes. So it actually is defined by this microvascular complications, which come along a little later than in type 2 than you would see with macrovascular. But again, the endogenous insulin is the problem we have. Now there have been a number, this is kind of technical, but the only point I want to make is there have been some very large studies that have been done trying to prove the benefit of glucose control in people with di in type 2 diabetes. This particular one is actually type 1. It's the only one that's type 1. All the rest of these are type 2. And what it said is all these studies where they tried to get one group in better control than the other group, that in each case the microvascular complications improved. And the reason I put a question mark by the VADT they tried to do a complex microvascular outcome as what they called their primary outcome of microvascular disease and it didn't show a st statistical difference but in fact if they took the more common way of doing it and say well what percentage of patients get microalbuminuria or progressive kidney disease it was very clear that it made a significant difference. So uh, it really did show a difference. Uh, 
But in cardiovascular disease, in these studies, which could be anywhere from a few to up to eight years or 10 years, uh, you couldn't show that there was a statistical difference in terms of cardiovascular disease by just controlling blood sugar. So the first point there is that that's why it's important to, do, you know, to check the lipids, to treat with statins and uh, control blood pressure and do the other things. And then mortality was not uh, changed by a reduction in blood sugar in those studies. And then there's this one exception, the ACCORD trial that we were part of. Um, and the ACCORD trial was a large NIH trial that was trying to get half of the patients down to an A1C of 6% with type 2 diabetes, and the other half tried to be about 7.5%. And what happened was uh, that the, type, the group that tried to get to 6% actually had more cardiovascular mortality instead of less. And so we're, we keep wondering, why did that happen? How could that possibly be? It's really complex, and I don't want to confuse things too much, but the fact is if you looked at people who got to 7 to 6% early and easy, their, their uh, cardiovascular risk was actually significantly reduced. The people who had problems and that accounted for all the cardiovascular death were the people who had A1Cs of 8% or higher and they were trying oh, hard, we, we were part of the study, and what you had to do is every time that patient came in, if they were not at goal, you were supposed to change something. So these patients ended up on one medication, two medications, three medications, one insulin, four doses of insulin per day, and you were giving it and giving it giving it, and what's one of the issues that comes up this way? Those patients that weren't getting down, part of the reason they weren't getting down was because they weren't taking their medicine properly. And so if you keep increasing the doses, it's artificial and it's dangerous. And we suspect that one of the problems was when they finally did take their insulin, for instance, they would get hypoglycemic. And these were patients with high cardiovascular risk. So that was a, 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 an important point for us to recognize. Now, if you looked at what happened over time when they followed them up later, you can see that one thing was that the microvascular benefit persisted, but now you, the longer you went, you started to see benefits in terms of cardiovascular disease. So that in fact, reducing glucose does help reduce cardiovascular disease, but much less than a statin, for instance. So most of these would, like the UK PDS, would suggest that a 1% reduction in A1C would decrease cardiovascular disease or events by about 15% whereas a statin will decrease at over 30%. So it's not as impactful. The glucose control itself is not as impactful as a statin would be in terms of cardiovascular disease. And then in the UK PDS, it showed that over time that you could actually reduce mortality uh, if, by having better glucose control as well. This is sort of dizzying in a sense it's intended to be. The point is that uh, up until 2004, we had a few agents, and then we have all these agents that have come thrown at you. It's hard to keep straight which are which. For instance, a lot of people keep thinking of DPP-4 inhibitors like citagliptin, which is Genuvia, as being, uh, as being just like the injectable agents, but now they're oral. I think they've gotten past that, but they aren't the same at all. They're much less potent. And, they have few side effects, but they're not nearly as, uh, don't have as much efficacy. And even in 2014, we had a whole batch of them. We haven't really had new agents uh, since that time uh, in this area. And then insulins, likewise, have increased a few insulins. First human insulins came in 1977. Rapid-acting analogs came in the early 90s. Um, there was uh, prolonged basal insulins like Glargine a little after about 2001. And then there was inhaled insulin once that was taken off the market. Does anybody use, has anybody used the new inhaled insulin? Sure, well, the doctor in the back that's going to talk to you <laughs> has used it. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I know, that's the problem. We haven't used it very much. Uh, and I think it's going to be a hard one to use. It has some real benefits. It's very quick, but there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of barriers as to why it won't become popularized. And then these new ultra-long-acting basal insulins. And you do have to be careful when you're talking about glargine. Remember, there's U100 glargine, which is either Lantus or Basaglar, and I think Basaglar is preferred. Is that right? Um, and then there's uh, Traceba, which is um, Degladec. When these are, uh, are much longer, is longer acting like U300 glargine. This is, I regret putting this slide in because I actually had a better slide that I think. But the point of this slide is simply to say, 
that the reason, one of the reasons people can justify having so many drugs is that although these aren't, the, if you say why do people get diabetes or what are the primary pathophysiologic features, it's really the insulin secretion is decreased, that the um, insulin sensitivity, which I guess they don't even have, we don't, well glucose uptake and utilization is decreased, meaning the insulin sensitivity is decreased, uh, and then you get increased hepatic glucose production Again, that really happens as you get diabetes. But those are the three primary ones, but all these other factors basically play into making diabetes worse or making hyperglycemia worse. And that's why there are justification for having different medications with different mechanisms uh, to do this. Now, it's also noted that this uses the more generic term of incretins, which are DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. Uh, but there are differences even in that in terms of, for instance, the DPP-4 inhibitors like citagliptin don't decrease appetite, uh, but the GLP-1 agonists do. Uh, hepatic glucose production is decreased with GLP-1 agonists and it's not even shown on here. The reason it's decreased is because it decreases glucagon secretion, um, which uh, stimulates increased, people with diabetes, either type 1 or type 2, tend to have more increased or increase in glucagon secretion whereas people who are normal, when they eat a meal, their glucagon would go down. But in people with diabetes, it doesn't go down, and that's obviously counterproductive because it releases more glucose from the liver. Now, this is complicated, but again, there's a, all I want you to focus on is the fact this is the American Diabetes Association treatment algorithm. This is the one that just came out. I would, if you had one resource you were going to look at things for diabetes, I would probably use that January issue of Diabetes Care where they have a supplemental issue that has all the standards of care from the American Diabetes Association. And the important point here um, is, is or, or you can get that, by the way, by just going to diabetes.org and go into the professional section. And it's easy to get it, so you can just put a, pull up a PDF and put it on your computer or whatever. But in the uh, antihyperglycemia treatment component, they changed slightly this year. For one thing, they made this so that lifestyle management keeps coming up all the way along. If you think back a few years ago, they swayed and said they didn't, they didn't really put lifestyle management on here. They said everybody should be started on metformin at the beginning, and then they had what medications you should take. Well, lifestyle management, I think, is likely you should really look at it as having at least equivalent effect of any one drug. So exercise, can, if somebody could change their exercise significantly, they could have a dramatic effect. If they could change their diet significantly, they could have an effect. And so it's always important to put that in there, especially when patients are reluctant to take other medications, tell them this is an option. But on the other hand, the reason metformin was put in the algorithm as the first thing always from the beginning was that the, uh, that, uh, the history would indicate that if you look at this, what happens is the patients come back and say, oh, just let me exercise and diet. And three months later, yeah, I didn't get as much, but I am now I'm, I'm, you know, something happened, my sister had a problem or something happened and oh, give me another three months. And a year later, uh, you're just not, you haven't really accomplished anything. So the point is you probably want to do both, monotherapy with metformin and lifestyle management, but you don't want to de-emphasize lifestyle management. And now the options after metformin, if your A1C is high, are sulfonylurea, thiazolidinedione, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors made it in more recently, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and insulin. And then, of course, if that doesn't work, you go to a th a another option for triple therapy, and eventually you come down to combination uh, injectable therapy. The goal of this project is sort of let's, let's think more narrowly, let's think simpler, and see if we can just use that focus to get more people to goal. Now this, you can, uh, this would be, if they had a test, this is what you'd be tested on. Um, but actually, all it's really indicating is that they're one of the other reasons there's so many different medications is that you can argue there's differences in how much they would reduce the A1C, there's differences in how, what their likelihood is of causing hypoglycemia or weight gain. You can see basically that any drug that uh, can cause hypoglycemia is associated with weight gain. Uh, and then dosing, because I do believe that, uh, that adherence is a big issue and why patients don't, uh, don't get to goal. And so anything that is, has to be given less often is more likely to be adhered to than something that has to be given three times a day, for instance. And then there's unique factors about the different agents. So this is a modified diabetes treatment plan um, that is proposed for this project. 
and it basically says, yes, monotherapy with metformin first, your second choice should be sulfonylurea, and people could argue about that, except there's just no, at the moment, we don't have evidence that there's anything wrong, we don't have good evidence there's anything wrong with sulfonylurea, and it is cheap, and it is effective, and so I think it's totally appropriate to say that should be the second drug. And then the qu point is if that does, if those two don't work together, then what? Well, the choices are basal insulin, uh, which could be NPH or glargine, or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And they say if you do basal insulin, you'd start at 0.15 units per kilogram, and you give them a sheet as to how to do this, and we'll talk about that a little later. And, if, and you basically would keep titrating, trying to get your fasting glucose down under 120 milligrams per deciliter. On the other side, if you do a GLP-1 agent, which is particularly appropriate if you have a patient with a BMI of 30 or greater, or for purposes of simplicity, we put in a weight of 100 kilograms, uh, that that would be a reason you might consider this. And you expect some nausea and vomiting. Uh, most of the time it subsides. Only about 5 to 7 percent of patients don't continue on it because of that. But you do want to coach them up front because if they get frightened by it, if they aren't, aren't prepared for it, uh, they will uh, stop it and not let you know until they come back three months later or something. And then finally, if those don't work, where you added one of those two, then if you had basal insulin, you could consider adding mealtime insulin, which oftentimes is started with the largest one dose at the largest meal of the day, uh, or you could add a GLP-1 agonist instead of mealtime. If you're on a GLP-1, probably the simplest thing to do is at that point add your basal insulin uh, uh, in addition. Everybody pr pretty familiar with metformin changes? Um, it's one of the things that we get a lot of questions, where, where, where I shouldn't say we get a lot of questions, we get a lot of indications that people don't understand. For a long time, endocrinologists and diabetes specialists believed that, that we shouldn't, that if you had an a EGFR that was less than 60, it didn't really mean you should stop your insulin, or if you had a creatinine that was greater than 1.4 or 1.5, depending on gender, that you really didn't need to stop it, but you'd probably decrease it. And it turned out that the FDA reviewed this and uh, completed their review in 2016 and, and made new guidelines. So you wouldn't take it if the EGFR was less than 30. You could start it if it's 30 to 45, but they don't necessarily recommend it because if you're dropping, you're likely to not be able to stay on it for too long. If the EGFR, if it's, if, let's say it's 45 to 60, and you start it, if it falls below 45, then assess the benefits of continuing treatment, but definitely decrease it once it drops below 30. And hold metformin at the time that you give a contrast or that you, uh, or there's a variety of other reasons that you would consider holding it. Uh, this is one that I actually have, and we always would say, yes, if somebody had severe congestive heart failure, we would stop it. Yet, to be honest with you, the evidence in the literature says that if you look at people who have congestive heart failure, whether they're on metformin or off, the ones who are on metformin do better than the ones who are off. But we still are always afraid of lactic acidosis, which it turns out is very rare, but uh, we don't want to cause a problem with it. So, yes? Um, if I may ask, going back just the, to the slide right before the met, the slide right before this, your algorithm, mm -hmm. I noticed that there wasn't an A1C threshold for starting the metformin. I wonder if you could just comment for a moment on sort of where we're at around recommending. I think most of us are working in environments where patients are going to not, are going to have significant difficulty with lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm more inclined to start the metformin when I see the A1C hitting 6 or even uh, 5.8. Yeah, so I suppose there's two questions in there. One is when it's 6.5 and you know you have diabetes, yes. I think you start metformin. Yes. If you're in the pre-diabetes range, where should you start it? We don't really know. We can't get good recommendations from anybody. But there is evidence that if you look at the diabetes prevention program, that the people who got benefit from metformin were the people who were um, under age 60, who were over BMI of, uh, I think, 35, but maybe even starting at 30, but definitely at 35, women who had gestational diabetes before that, and people who had an A1C of over 6 as opposed to under 6. So there are places where you would consider, and, and we know when we give metformin to women who have PCOS, who don't have diabetes at all. We actually ha don't have evidence that if women with, uh, become pregnant and take it into pregnancy that it causes a problem and it's actually recommended 
that those women with PCOS, for instance, would do it into the first trimester. Um, so it's a pretty safe drug, except from the point of what happens if you have renal insufficiency, although it has side effects, GI side effects. But yeah, so it's a little bit of an individual determination when your A1C is under 6.5%. Under but at least if you look at the higher, another one that I use is if a patient's from a family where they not only have diabetes frequently, but they have heart disease. I think that doing something about their diabetes as early as possible per, to prevent it or pro, uh, prevent its progression is worthwhile. But that's a good question. Sulfonureas, I think we mentioned effective and inexpensive uh, impact of both fasting and postprandio. Forced, they're kind of a forced insulin secretion. That's why they cause hypoglycemia. Remember these incretin agents have what we call glucose dependent insulin secretion. So as your glucose goes up, you end up making more insulin, but when your glucose goes down, it shuts off. That doesn't happen with sulfonureas. Hypoglycemia is really the most significant adverse effect. And it's particularly a problem in elderly, not only because it's more likely to occur, but because it can put people in the hospital for days. If we have a patient who ends up in the hospital with uh, hypoglycemia, severe hypoglycemia because they were on insulin, They'll, we're out of the woods within 24 hours. If you have a patient who comes into the hospital with hypoglycemia from a sulfonuria, it takes days, uh, at least three days, before you feel that you're uh, comfortable in uh, sending them home because there's something that clicks in that gets to be really severe about the hypoglycemia. It, and these are almost all elderly patients when that happens, but it can be a rare problem. Uh, lack of durability of response proposed. We're actually part of this grade trial. <coughs> Uh, some of you may, may know a little bit about it, um, but it uh, is basically a study that took all patients who had, had diabetes less than 10 years and were on metformin. It's an NIH-sponsored trial, and they got then this, they, their second drug was randomized to either get a sulfonuria, get a DPP-4 inhibitor, a GLP-1 agonist, or basal insulin, and then we're following them over 8 to 10 years and finding out what happens, which one holds down the blood glucose the longest, for instance. And the reason that study came up is there was a study last decade, and I think about was reported maybe 2004, 2005, called the ADOPT trial, which compared uh, a TZD to metformin to a sulfonuria in terms of what would happen, how soon would they fail and need a second agent, and sulfonuria's needed a second agent a lot quicker than the other two agents. So the point is, you know, what is the best second agent? And that's what this study will show. But at this point, that other study was sponsored by industry, um, and it looked like a reasonably good study, but they also didn't have their event rate calculated right, so they had to extend the study. So there were reasons to say it wasn't a definitive study. There is a subset of patients who are really sensitive to sulfonuria. Some of those will have one of the unique forms of MODI or maturity onset diabetes of youth, which is uh, really now called monogenic diabetes, but there are a couple abnorm genetic abnormalities that make people really sensitive to sulfonureas where just a half a milligram or a milligram of glomeparide will have a profound effect. Sometimes when they didn't respond to metformin, you take that small dose of sulfonuria and they'll respond really well. When to consider basal insulin? Well, maybe the second agent after metformin, at, per that protocol from the ADA, for instance, uh, when a combination of non-insulin agents become inadequate, so that's the more typical place. We've added a couple agents, we're not getting to go, now we add this basal insulin. Able to target your, your fasting glucose. You, if you get patients to check, again, we want targeted checking, but one of the things that's worthwhile is to tell a patient, well, you don't have to check your blood sugar every day, but I want you for at least this many days to check yourself before breakfast and before dinner, or potentially even before each meal. But even the breakfast and dinner will tell you which is higher, the morning blood sugar or the afternoon. Your assumption is it's going to be the afternoon, but you'll be surprised how, off, how often the morning blood sugar is higher, and that's because of excess hepatic glucose production at night. And so then putting on an insulin that targets the fasting glucose is really effective and is probably the most appropriate therapy. Unacceptable side effects of other agents, because insulin other than hypoglycemia essentially has no uh, side effects. And patients with advanced hepatic or renal disease, that's really kind of the same, same concept. When we get patients who are late in their kidney disease, for instance, insulin is a little problematic because it lasts a long time uh, because your kidney is what metabolizes the insulin. But nevertheless, it's still the safest drug you can use because it doesn't depend at all on kidney 
uh, function in terms of clearance uh, from uh, other ways. It doesn't build up. Um, why consider insulin early? So if we were to say, well, we're having this choice between a GLP-1 agent and, a, and basal insulin when we have that option in the tree. Well, it's really the most predictive way. We know that if you look at a GLP-1 agent, I really like those agents. I think they work great. I think they're convenient. I think patients love them once they get into them. <coughs> but there's about 15% of people who won't respond. There's nobody who won't respond to insulin. And so uh, it's, you, you, uh, insulin will always work. It's just a matter of getting the right dose or the right regimen. Effective targeting of fasting, as I said, but when you, there's two ways of looking at a, at a postprandial glucose. One is how high does the blood sugar go after a meal? The second one is what's the increment from before the meal to after the meal? And so if you say you're looking in a study and you say, oh, their postprandial blood sugars went down, that'll happen with, with basal insulin because it lowers the whole, uh, the, the whole uh, blood sugar scheme. So the excursion, it may not do too much to, but you're still, your after meal level will be lower than it was without it. Now, if you put in another agent, you might not only have the, the peak lower, but you'll actually decrease that increment as well. But you do get, but you will get some benefit in terms of postprandial numbers after a basal insulin. And then there's the preservation of the beta cell. An example is probably the best example is the origin trial, which was a study that um, Sanofi has this unbelievable luck of doing studies that turn out wrong but give them benefit somehow in terms of their marketing. <laughs> and so one of them we'll get into is the basal insulin thing uh, in a bit, uh, comparing it to NPH. But another one is in the origin trial, they gave insulin to people who either didn't have diabetes or people who had very in, uh, early diabetes. Uh, people had prediabetes or very early diabetes, but they had to have cardiovascular disease. And their goal was to prove that it decreased cardiovascular disease. It didn't decrease cardiovascular disease, but what they found is the people who had prediabetes didn't seem to progress to diabetes uh, as much, so somehow it was preserving their beta cell function. And uh, they also proved safety, so it didn't have any increase in cancer, it didn't have any increase in cardiovascular disease. So uh, they found some good things, even though their primary outcome uh, sort of failed. <coughs> uh, evidence that improved insulin secretion when added to oral agents. If you give people insulin in addition to oral agents, you can actually do some research type things to show that your beta cells work a little bit better. Um, and then there's some real fancy studies that show if you take people right at the time of diagnosis and put them on insulin, that, uh, you're, that they can stop the insulin after a period of a few months, and a year later, a significant number of them will still be off medication. So really early, there's some other evidence that you can actually preserve beta cell function. And they have a really good safety record other than that hypoglycemia. So is it likely that basal insulin will result in meeting the target? Um, and that depends, of course, on what you're, where you're starting and what you think will be reduced. So this was actually a study that was uh, reported by Dr. Riddle from, from OHSU uh, working with Sanofi but they took all the patients, 2,100 patients who had received Glargine in studies, and then they looked at, well, what happened to their A1C reduction based on where their A1C started? So it was less than 8%. It looked like adding basal insulin would reduce it a little less than 1%, and then you can go down to about 1.4%. You keep going down. If you look at patients that were specifically targeted for this project, you'll see that people who have an A1C of over 9%, they have a reduction of about 2% A1C. And people who had an A1C of over 9.5% had over a 2.5% A1C reduction. So basal insulin will make a difference. If you look at, on the other side, what percent will get to 7%, well, there you're going to get the opposite effect, that the lower the A1C, the more likely you're going to get to 7% than if you're so high that you're over 9.5%. But nevertheless, uh, this is a huge benefit uh, for patients in terms of, of, of risk of complications if you could just reduce it this much and not focus so much on just the 7% number. And this is the study that I was mentioning. So this is another Sanofi study. This one was to show that Glargine, or uh, their Lantus, uh, was superior to NPH as a basal insulin. And what they really showed was if you gave somebody, or if you had oral agents and you added NPH or Glargine, you actually had the very same reduction in terms of A1C. 
So if we, I generally think that if I went out and asked people, the majority of people think, well, glargine is superior for lowering blood sugar. It is not superior for lowering blood sugar. It's the same. But what happened, so that was their primary outcome, and it failed. But they made huge progress because, number one, they emphasized the decrease in hypoglycemia because NPH caused a lot more hypoglycemia. And then secondly, they put in a totally arbitrary titration thing saying, oh, if your blood sugar is over 120, you add two. If it's over 160, you add four, uh, and so forth. And just because they put that into the protocol, the company ended up producing those, handing them around, and people were suddenly having a guideline that they were using uh, for how they would titrate this. And so this basal insulin added to oral agents became really popular after this, but we oftentimes forget that except for the hypoglycemia issue, which, yes, that's significantly different, uh, and it's even a 40 plus percent reduction, the fact is that type 2 patients don't have a lot of hypoglycemia, so the reduction is significant, but there would be justification for a lot of patients that unless you fear, unless they have a particular demonstration or fear of hypoglycemia, you'd start with NPH, you could always switch to the other option. And this again shows that if you looked at the timing of when uh, you'd get a hypoglycemic episode, if you were on NPH, it's in the middle of the night, uh, like 3 to 5 a.m. is when you're most likely to get hypoglycemia if you put them on NPH, and you'll get much less hypoglycemia during the nighttime on glargine versus NPH. Well, the only way that these studies were done were with glargine at bedtime and NPH at bedtime. If you were going to give NPH in the morning added to oral agents, nobody's really done good studies on that. And so when we do it uh, for adding to oral agents with NPH, we always do it at nighttime. There is some evidence that with glargine you could give it in the morning or the evening and you could probably get about the same result. Um, so that is true, and it also has been demonstrated. So all the studies that were first done with glargine were done at bedtime, whether they're type one or type two studies, and so when it was first approved by the FDA, it was actually approved with a nighttime dosing uh, recommendation, but then they went back and did studies to show that on the average person, if you gave it in the morning or you gave it in the evening uh, for glargine, you would get the same A1C. The difference would be that with one of them, you'd get more hypoglycemia at nighttime. The other, you'd get more hypoglycemia during the daytime. So when, do, when would you say, well, if we started basal insulin, why, when is it not enough? When it's time to say, let's give up on this? Well, when the A1, this is arbitrary. I'm not saying this is an absolute. But a lot of people have said this, that when it's more than 2% above the target after you've titrated, if you're still over 2% above the target, so if you're over 9%, that would be, uh, for people that are pretty high, that would be a, a reason that you'd want to, uh, uh, to move on to something else. When the A1Cs are still not at target on, on basal, so let's say you, you end up, when you do basal, one of the nice features is that all you're concerned with is the morning blood sugar. You're using that to titrate the dose. So if you end up with a good blood sugar in the morning below 120, as your goal is, but your A1C is high, what does that tell you? You must be high at some other part of the day, and therefore you have to probably move on to something else because you can't do much more with this. Uh, or the postprandial value, just another way of looking at that, I guess, is that the postprandial values are above target. So if you check after meals, you can demonstrate that problem. Even if you just check a few times, you can say, well, this is where the issue is, obviously. Some people would say if you reach a total dose of 0.5 units per kilogram per day of basal insulin, so if somebody were a 100 kilogram person, that would be 50 units. Other people don't really believe that, and we have lots of patients, like in our grade trial, we have patients who are on 80 units a day or 90 units a day of basal insulin. Um, so that's a relative thing, but you do, you certainly get to some point where you say, hey, I can't just keep adding this. And a practical thing is that if uh, depending on whether they're using a syringe, which will hold 100 units, or they're using a pen. I can't remember, Basiglar only comes in a pen, doesn't it? Um, so if you're using Basiglar, I think, is it still 80 units, pharmacists know? You can give 100 in a single injection? That's because you have two unit things, okay. So um, that, those kinds of things might be limitations. You're going to have to stick twice to get the result, but those are you know, not real science kinds of things. Uh, advanced insulin therapy with your options once you get to that point that you say, well, basal alone isn't enough, is again to advance insulin therapy with prandial insulin. Uh, 
which could be either adding uh, basal or do a basal bolus regimen or adding bolus insulin to your basal or switching to a mixed insulin or premixed insulin. Um, or you could add a GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, if it was tolerated, not contraindicated, and is affordable, but at least in this project, they're going to make it affordable for the patient at least uh, to happen. This again is from the American Diabetes, and what they're really saying, if that A1C is not controlled on your basal insulin, that you could go to uh, one rapid acting uh, dose of insulin before the largest meal and then keep progressing to potentially end up at three meals. Uh, or you could change to premix, although believe me, in the, if you read this, they don't recommend premix. Uh, and then your last chance, and this used to be in small print until this year. It just said in small print, consider a GLP-1 agonist. Well, this year it got elevated to a uh, more prominent uh, thing, and this is the color, that, that the way they did it. So you really have three options, although I think the premixed is, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Berto, are you going to talk about premixed still? So you'll hear a little bit about that. And premixed, it isn't that it doesn't work. It's just that it r reduces some of your flexibility and predisposes you to more hypoglycemia. So some of the news in GLP-1 agonist use is that these agents are equal or greater A1, or they cause equal or greater A1C reduction compared to basal insulin, that they're proven affected when added to basal insulin, that uh, short-acting agents such as exenatide, which is Vieta, have primary effect on postprandial, and you'll see that in a minute, whereas the long-acting ones have some effect on fasting and postprandial, but the postprandial effect is a little less than actually the short-acting one. Uh, and the risk of pancreatitis that we hear so much about is actually not very certain, even though it's still in the package insert. Now that we've had all these big cardiovascular studies, uh, uh, studies for safety, none of those studies have shown an increase in, in pancreatitis in patients who have received GLP-1 uh, agonists. We, d we do think that pancreatitis is increased in uh, patients with type 2 diabetes, which is part of the problem. And secondly, I think the company Novo has told me multiple, several times they believe that pancreatitis does occur uh, a little more often with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, except now they're becoming convinced that the reason that would happen is because some of these patients get significant weight loss and get gallstones and that it's the gallstone pancreatitis that probably makes up any difference in frequency. Uh, and then no good evidence for pancreatic cancer, which was something that was promoted by a particular physician down at UCLA when these were first coming out, but there's no evidence in that. Again, in these large cardiovascular trials where they have you know, 10,000 patients in some of the studies, there doesn't seem to be any indication that that's a problem. Their major side effects are GI, nausea, and diarrhea. How do GLP-1 receptor agonists compare to basal insulin? Again, this looks pretty much like what you saw when we were talking about uh, NPH versus glargine. Well, here if you take two shots of short-acting uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists or glargine, you can see that you reduce your A1C the same for those. And you learn your lesson about what they do, what's different about these two approaches, if you look at the seven-point testing, so this is where they had them multiple times during the study, they would do seven blood sugar checks per day, uh, including one at 3 a.m. And what you would find is that if for the short-acting one, the basal insulin primarily affects fasting. So you can see over here with Bieta, you didn't reduce your fasting very much, whereas with, uh, with Glargine, you reduced your fasting much more. But if you went to say what happens with short-acting GLP-1 receptor agonists, they totally eliminated this peak uh, after the meal. The problem is they're very short-acting, and so they don't eliminate the peak after the second meal. And uh, so at lunchtime, they don't have enough left to really have that much impact on lunch. We actually did a study called flat sugar where, number one, we proved that if you gave patients um, by eta, or you gave them rapid acting insulin with their basal insulin that you would get the same result in terms of A1C reduction but also we in that study it, we, it, I think it was a real flaw that we originally said we were going to use by eta three times a day where we would use not more than the total amount that's allowed by the FDA which is uh, 10 micrograms twice a day or 20 micrograms but that we would give five micrograms, five micrograms, and 10 micrograms uh, 
and it uh, and unfortunately some of the investigators chickened out and said no you can offer that but I don't think we should do that standard and we weren't able to get enough information but I think that would probably be the way that you would get rid of this peak uh, to some degree but nobody really does that and again you'd be three shots a day which would although you wouldn't have to check blood sugars as often as you would with insulin uh, the fact is you would still have to take an injection just as often. Uh, and then if you look at, those were short acting ones compared to basal insulin. This is long acting ones compared to basal insulin and actually in this case liraglutide uh, did better uh, than basal insulin. To be honest with you, when you go to any of these studies and they're done over and over and over, somebody will get up in the audience and say, well, well what happened though? Did what what was the fasting glucose that you got these people to with basal insulin? And invariably they'll say, oh, it was 130. And the person will say, well, see, you didn't titrate the basal insulin enough. You should have had that much lower than 130. But the fact is, if in all these research, in every research, there's not been a single research study, including the original treat to target, that got the, the fasting glucose to an average of less than 120. So if that says if in a research setting you don't do it, then in an everyday clinical setting, it's really hard to get your average that low. Um, so indeed, this probably wasn't as low as we would say is ideal, but I think it's what people are going to do. And in that setting, at least, uh, long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonists seem to do a little better than basal insulin. And then what happens if you add a GLP-1 receptor agonist to basal insulin? Um, this is a study that shows addition of resenatide to glargine. You can see a reduction in A1C that's greater. Uh, you see hemoglobin number of percentage of patients who reach an A1C of 77% was over, it was 60%. And of course, there's significant differences if you just titrate it, because the other group could keep titrating the, the lantus or the glargine, that uh, you would get weight gain versus weight loss. Basal insulin in this case was decreased by 20% uh, initially if the A1C was less than 8%. So when you do the, and we don't know that that's necessary, but I think for caution's sake, when you start adding something to basal insulin in particular, you have to be careful. Remember the one thing about basal insulin, the way we use it in type two, which is totally different than the way we use it in type one. And the concept of a basal insulin is the insulin that you need uh, when you're not eating, that your body always makes a little insulin even when you're not eating and that's the basal insulin. And so for type one, that concept is pretty simple. But the insulins that are used for that are long-acting insulins, the same insulins that we use for this purpose. And the problem being that when you give that at bedtime and you're looking at the morning blood sugar, you're not looking at the evening blood sugar. So you're actually driving down the glucose overnight. And so once you get, so if the patient could potentially be going to bed with a blood sugar of 200, and you've titrated up to 50 units of Lantus, when and in the morning you're in a great position, if you do anything to make that bedtime blood sugar 120, then that same amount of glargine is going to cause you to get low at night. So when you do, when you're in pretty good control and you add in those, you might want to back off on the basal insulin as you add something to help out the, the pre-bedtime blood glucose if you want to look at it that way. And when you did this, when they compared using uh, adding exenatide, I mean adding exenatide to basal glargine versus just titrating up the glargine, the hypoglycemia was not statistically different. This is a study actually that I authored that again looked at what happened if in this case what they did was they took patient, we took patients who were controlled, or poorly controlled basically, but they were uh, on lantus or glargine and then what would happen if we would, uh, we backed off on the same way, we backed off 20% if the A1C was less than 8%, but then what happened was if you took the uh, glargine route and used them at their baseline versus adding this, you reduced your A1C by 1.3%. If you, you'd backed off on the insulin, but all the patients uh, who didn't, who got placebo, ended up going back up uh, in their insulin dose where the ones who got the GLP-1 receptor agonist didn't, and then uh, the fasting glucose also reduced significantly. Um, insulin dose went down, was 11% lower, and the weight was lower. How does the addition of a GLP-1 agonist to basal insulin compare to adding, so if we're at that point, we could add uh, meal doses, uh, which is what we always did in the past. And you can see that again, the less it is, you get the same kinds of results. So here, 
using uh, exenatide uh, twice a day, you ended up lowering the A1C. If you used, um, I'm trying to see what the difference, can't remember, um, I'm blanking on what the difference between these two is. It, I think they just reproduced this one, actually. Um, but if you look over here, probably the easier way to look at it. So added Lispro before meals or added exenatide twice a day. The basal insulin was initially decreased by 10%, in this case, if less than 8%. And adding the GLP-1 receptor egg, egg reduced, uh, got the same A1C reduction, a lower fasting glucose, less nocturnal hypoglycemia, a weight benefit. This is the weight down in this corner, pretty big difference in weight and reduce blood pressure as well. The GLP-1 receptor agonists tend to reduce blood pressure somewhat. They actually increase the pulse a little bit, um, but nobody's figured out exactly whether that's just due to the blood pressure drop or what the cause of that is, uh, but they haven't seen any consequences. And as you know, liraglutide, well this isn't liraglutide, but liraglutide was just approved a couple of weeks ago as uh, in terms of FDA that they can put on an indication that it's beneficial for reducing cardiovascular events because of a study. And they have improved quality of life that they report when they did this study. And this one isn't, albiglutide as you'll see in a minute, isn't something you're gonna have an option to use. There have been other long acting agents. This is a once weekly GLP-1 receptor agonist and the reason it's not gonna stay on the market is because nobody's using it. Because it's not as potent as the other ones and it doesn't cause as much weight loss as the other ones. Um, but it does demonstrate the principle. The other ones, there are, have been abstract reports of the other ones, but they haven't been published yet when I went to look for this. But this one shows that if you, this is a long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist versus Lispro, and you can see again that what happened is there was greater A1C reduction with the GLP-1 agent. There was weight benefit, there was less hypoglycemia, and more GI symptoms are something that you always have to recognize will be the major limiting factor. So adding a GLP-1 receptor agonist to basal insulin is equally effective compared to adding prandial or analog insulins, but you get less glucose monitoring, significant weight benefit, fewer doses, less hypoglycemia, lower insulin doses for the basal insulin you have, but you're going to have GI side effects um, and that's uh, something that you have to get patients past and know that some patients just aren't going to be able to continue it. Yes? Do you know in the studies where they were comparing GLP-1s to prandial insulin, at baseline they talk about in the patients the length of time they've had diabetes, is that significant? Um, that's a good question. I can't remember specifically if people have done the analysis, post hoc analysis, but I can tell you that all these studies that are done, these aren't patients who are far advanced. They're almost always having a duration of diabetes like 12 to 13 years, sometimes longer, because yes, that's where you end up having to make this decision most often. But um, you would think that would be true, but yet I can tell you that I just presented some data on a drug called semaglutide, which isn't approved by the FDA, but is another GLP-1 receptor agonist that's given once a week. And, we, and it included five different studies that are called the SUSTAIN trials. And one of them was just um, naive, where it was compared to placebo and people who weren't on anything. One of them was compared to citagliptin. One of them was compared to exenatide extended release. One of them was compared to basal insulin and one of them was added to basal insulin. And, and the duration of diabetes ranged from like three years in the, one, the first one to uh, I think something like 15 years in the fifth one, and yet it had the same result in every one of them. They all reduced the A1C by 1.5 to 1.8 percent, and they got 70 uh, percent of the patients to goal. So for some reason, that study says that, that the GLP-1 receptor agonists do really well even with prolonged duration of diabetes. Um, I think we need more information on that, but it was rather impressive. Um, some things on GLP-1 receptor agonist by eta, you start with five micrograms twice a day and then you go to 10 micrograms twice a day after about a month. Uh, by durian, which is a once a week, it's two milligrams once weekly. You just give that right from the beginning, it builds up so slowly. I did some of the original studies on this clinically and it actually has a half-life or it has a duration of action that's probably more like two to three weeks. And they could have given it, they even did some studies to show that you could give it every two or three weeks. But the fact is, that would be even harder than once a week. So it isn't like it would necessarily improve adherence. Uh, Victoza, 
um, or liraglutide is 0.6 milligrams for the first week. And then if they're not getting nausea, you go up to 1.2. For purposes of this study, or for this effort, 1.2 is recommended as the top dose. You can go to 1.8, but the difference in A1C reduction between those two is not very great. And therefore, I think it's reasonable to think that our primary target here is 1.2. Side effects we talked about. Uh, you get more, the injection site in, uh, reactions are more likely with bidurian, which uh, is, creates like a little uh, bleb in, under the skin uh, that will go away. So patients get concerned, they'll come back to you and say, oh, this is terrible, this thing is happening, look at these. But they'll always go away, they're just kind of annoying at the beginning when patients get those. Um, and then there is going to be a prior auth criteria. Uh, that you should become familiar with. The A1C, the standard has been A1C of 7.5 to less than 9.9 percent who have failed oral therapy and basal insulin, or basal is inappropriate due to obesity. So what this is kind of doing is giving you that option to say, if you really want to use one of these, you can use the idea that this patient is, has a BMI of over 30 um, and that this will probably be more effective in them. So. You have your choices. There's two good options with basal insulin and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Or if the A1C is greater than 9%, rationale of why mealtime insulin cannot be used um, is part of the prior auth. But I think prior auths will not, you, you'll have to do them for this project, but I don't think they're going to be a problem for you. It's not going to be something you have to fight for. You just have to give one of those reasons why you're doing it. Uh, some of the things about administration, by eight, it should be given up to 60 minutes uh, before two, the two main meals and at least six hours apart. Uh, must prime the pen the first use. The 60 mil, uh, minutes, what will happen is that's something you'll probably have to get adjusted to, too, if you haven't used a lot of it. If you put it closer to the meal, you're going to get less nausea. If you pull it back further from the meal, you're going to get more nausea, but you will get more weight loss, it appears, too. So you find sort of the sweet spot for any patient. Uh, and it's more practical for most patients to give it close to the meal. They have a hard time thinking, well, I'm going to eat in an hour. I think I'll take it now. Victoza is once a day without regard to meals. Bidurian is once a week without regard to meals. And then the Tanzium, which has been on, won't be available uh, in the near future. So. so let's talk about a case. So we have a 68-year-old man with type 2 diabetes, 13 years duration, been on metformin, sulfonylurea, has a high A1C, the usual comorbidities, but in this case actually had a cabbage 18 months ago, is on glomeparide and metformin, and then the usual other things for blood pressure and for cholesterol. Blood pressure is a little marginally high at this point. BMI is over 30, has a sternotomy scar, obviously has some leg edema and some sensory uh, loss. Um, and some background diabetic retinopathy. Uh, creatinine is 1.1. Microalbumin is a little elevated. So let's say we were doing this and you got this microalbumin that you were, last year was fine, this year you checked it and it was 38. Does this patient have microalbuminuria with normal being under 30? It's a trick question, but the answer is no. You have to have two abnormalities. The first time you get an abnormality in microalbumin, if you repeat it, you have more than a 50% chance that the next one will be normal. Um, so there's enough variation in the test that whether exercise and you know, fevers, illness, a number of things will cause a temporary false positive. So you want to have two abnormalities to call somebody microalbuminuria. What's the A1C goal? Just the whole point of that is the goal isn't 7% for all people. And in this case, for a patient who had cardiovascular disease, people might argue his goal should probably be 7.5%, not necessarily 7%. But part of that equation is what agents you use. If you use an agent that can cause hypoglycemia, then you really have to adhere to that higher goal. If you use something that doesn't cause hypoglycemia, you can safely push because if you're not causing hypoglycemia, we think that avoids most of the morbidity that would come from treatment. What medication would you add now that you had this patient who was on sulfonylurea and metformin? Well, you could add basal insulin or GLP-1 receptor agonists are both good options. This patient does have a BMI over 30. What differences would you expect if you chose one versus the other? Basal insulin targets your fasting glucose, right? And uh, is highly effective where GLP-1 will have more side effects but we'll probably have an equal, at least an equal reduction in terms of A1C. Uh, 
and will lower weight. So you've got choices. You can make those choices for each patient, but the point is you're getting down to just two choices, not thinking about all those other drugs that were on those original lists. So you chose basal insulin. How do you dose? This is a little, you can start lower, but I think this is safe for almost all patients, 0.15 units per kilo <coughs> per day, and then monitor the glucose and adjust every three to seven days by, ten, by two units. You can find probably six different methods that people have put out there for titrating, and it doesn't make any difference. What you want to do is have a consistent method and that is easy for patients to understand, and I think the one that's used here is, it fits into that category. So target a morning glucose of less than 120. Many of the studies target a glucose of less than 100, but believe me, that's hard to do without getting hypoglycemia. The basal insulin dose in this case was increased up to 48 units. In the treat to target study, what was the average basal insulin that was required for those type two patients? Did anybody know? 48 units. So uh, the average dose that you have to think about is about 48 units that people use. Some people use higher, some people can use much lower. A1C is decreased with that down to 7.6%. Again, because this guy has cardiovascular disease, we think that's not too bad. We could be satisfied with that. But six months later, the A1C is up to 8.3%. What does happen with, with uh, basal insulin sometimes is that you get down to your goal and you're really happy but sometimes early, sometimes late, you suddenly realize you have to keep titrating and keep titrating and your doses keep getting higher and the patient probably gains some weight to contribute to that process. So what do you do if you're back up over your goal? You may want to reduce the basal insulin by 20% because uh, of your thinking about adding the GLP-1 agent as we talked about, but we don't know for sure where that applies because these were arbitrary decisions for studies when they used 20% if the A1C was less than 8%. Um, in that case, uh, the addition of GLP-1 agonists may cause nocturnal hypoglycemia if you don't decrease it because what it will do is decrease your bedtime glucose over what you've had. Start the dose low and build up as we talked about. And liraglutide 0.6 milligrams for the first week and 1.2 the next week, if they tolerate it. Um, Yes. May I just ask some, some sort of basic, uh, like, practical questions about the basal insulin, which we debate all the time in our clinic. I'm out at OHSC Richmond. I'm one of the family docs out there. Um, so a couple, it's, I, and maybe maybe there are differing opinions on this, but number one, um, sort of the logic behind having the patient take the, the basal insulin in the morning versus the night. Number two, is it true or not true that you can only give up to 50 units in a single location and you should break up the dose? Uh, into two locations, and then three, is there any logic to, to splitting the insulin dose? Um, I've seen patients come into the hospital on Lantus both in the morning and the evening, and so those, those three questions, if, if one of you could answer them. So the time when, you, when I think the splitting dose is totally logical is that in some type ones, U100 glargine does not last 24 hours. And so let's say you're giving it at bedtime. What will happen is you'll give your dinner dose and you'll see your blood sugar going up before you go to bed, not necessarily because you didn't give enough with the meal, but because you ran out of your glargine. And so in those cases, we were frequently dosing them twice a day because now we're going to even it out and we're not going to have any period of time where we're running out of insulin. So for type 1s, it makes a lot of sense, or did make a lot of sense. Some people propose that happened 20 to 30 percent of the time. Now we have these ultra-long-acting basal insulins. They do get past that, but they're more expensive, they, they have some, some benefit in terms of reducing hypo, nocturnal hypoglycemia even more. They don't actually, haven't been shown to decrease A1Cs further. So that's one thing. But the rest of the one about where to start, you will get, if you asked 100 people this question, you'd probably get 100 different answers. What I can tell you is there's no data to tell you that there's a point at which you should separate the dose just due to the volume and that the companies will tell you they don't see any indication and that if you went to 80 units and an 80 unit in, a, in an injector that gave 80 units, they wouldn't propose that you separate that out. Um, and for type 2s, you're usually going to get a prolonged effect with these as opposed to type 1s where you might run out. So it, it, it's really arbitrary. We sometimes switch trying to convince ourselves it makes a difference, but there's not good data uh, about that, and there certainly isn't good data if you're going to do that based on dose as to when you would do that. Morning versus evening, I think when you're using the U100 
long-acting insulin, you would say, to ask the patient which is more likely for you to take on a consistent basis because some people have a hard time taking their dose when they first get up because they're running out the door and they're not eating their breakfast. Other ones will fall asleep every night and not be able to take it at bedtime consistently, so I just try to decide where it's easier for them to take it. So. Yep. Yep. Now, if you want to do a study to prove whether that's true or not, you can. <laughs> but I don't think the company will support it. So. A uh, 59 year old woman with type 2 of 14 years duration has metformin, citagliptin, and glargine at this point. Lower dose, um, not much important there. Uh, creatinine's okay, A1C is over 9%. Fasting glucose isn't too bad, 138. So what are the options? So you could add a sulfonuria. In this case, our patients would be on a sulfonuria, but in this case it wasn't. You could increase the glargine, which is at 38 now. You could add a TZD. You could add meal insulin. You could add meal insulin once a day. You could change the citagliptin to araglutide or xenotide, uh, LAR, and then uh, and use that. So these are sort of a little atypical example. So if you added a sulfonuria, uh, it could work, but it's not likely that as you get later and later in the process, sulfonurias are less likely to have their, that benefit. What about increasing the glargine? Again, most of these patients could benefit from more titration, including this patient, uh, but the average dose, as I said, was about, whoops, the average dose was about 48 units to reach goal in the studies. and uh, Reducing, it, uh, reducing to mean glucose to less than 120 in this case would probably not lower your A1C to the degree that you would get back down to 7.5% uh, in that patient or lower. This patient didn't have heart disease, so you'd actually be going for 7%. Add a TZD, can increase insulin sensitivity and will decrease your A1C in a lot of patients who are uh, insulin resistant, but it'll almost always be associated with some weight gain and that will be compounded when it's mixed with insulin. So both edema and weight gain are a particular problem when you add TZDs uh, to insulin. And it's associated with bone loss in a woman um, uh, to some degree. I guess we mentioned that. And so what are the other ones? Add meal insulin, that'll be a reasonable choice, but it's going to take, you're going to monitor more, you're going to have more hypoglycemia, you have to have a patient who's going to be willing to take that injection at lunch, add meal insulin at dinner, that's a good choice um, as an option because it's simplified and for a lot of patients it will make more difference than you would expect even though it's not three times a day. And then finally, what about if you switched loraglutide or xenotide? It might work because the GLP-1 receptor agonists clearly are more efficacious than the DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, and it would have some weight benefits and address the postprandial needs more than a GLP-1, I mean, than a DPP-4 would. And there's growing experience about using these with insulin, as we've talked about for the last hour. Okay, I'll take one or two questions, but we have to get a break. Yes. One more question, sorry. So, what is so according to, just thinking about Dadamir, so at, where I work at Virginia Garcia, um, we, you know, we can sell three months of Lavamir for $7. We use a lot of Lavamir. So mm -hmm. although there's some evidence that at smaller doses, daily doses, it may only work for like 16 hours versus, you know, with larging, you get that nice 24 hours. So in your experience, do you feel that at higher doses of that in here, it may work for up to 24 hours, or how do you feel about So it depends on where you're talking about. So if I were treating a type two, type one patient, I never start type one patients on once a day uh, Detamir. I always start them in twice a day because I'm convinced it's not gonna last 24 hours and they're going to get a deficit of in, a basal insulin at some point. But in type twos, remember, what happened when NPH was used compared to uh, glargine. They worked equally well. Well, Detamir works. That's twice a day, just to make sure, right? No. If you give NPH at bedtime added to oral agents, or you give glargine at bedtime added to oral agents, you'll get the same A1C reduction. 
it's hard to understand why that would be because in one case you have large gene running through the whole day, but it's been proven over and over and over. There are lots of studies like this. They've all found that same thing. So if you give NPH, it works. Detamer will work better, meaning you'll get less hypoglycemia than NPH if you use Detamer. And you just have to use it once a day at bedtime um, in type 2s. And you'll get at least as good a results, I think, as you will with glargine and less hypoglycemia than you will with uh, NPH. So I think Detamer is a great one for this purpose. Now, one of the questions that comes up with Detamer a little bit, there's a subset we've never been able to understand require more Detamer than they did glargine, for instance. And I don't know why that occurred, but it did show up in several studies. But also, the, some of the studies were really well or poorly uh, um, planned. And they actually, right from the beginning, let the investigators say, well, if you don't get your blood sugar at a certain point in the afternoon with the Detamir, add a second dose. And they ended up with more than 50% of the patients were taking two doses of Detamir compared to one dose of glargine. And it skewed a lot of the numbers. They never should have done that. The people who did that, I know well, and they recognized that that was a blunder. Um, but for all practical purposes, Detamir would be great for this population. And anything I said about glargine would be appropriate for Detamir, except I would use that all the time at bedtime rather than in the morning. Because then you're not, you know, you're, what you want is to turn off glucose production during the night uh, from the liver. And you might not have enough left of the Detamir if you give it in the morning to do that. But if you give it at bedtime, you definitely will. So do you feel at higher doses, there's not a lot of evidence that yes, it Almost any insulin has been proven many years ago in NPH, Lente, the bigger the dose, the longer it acts. And so I think that's probably true for Detamir. Um, I think it's true to some degree for the obese patients when it comes to glargine. Um, but, but it's not a dependable thing that you can use it and say, well, gee, if I increase the dose enough, it'll stretch out. So it's not very useful clinically. So. I've seen in my, in my practice, yeah, smaller doses of glargine. Yeah, it def you don't see it working as long as when they just said at higher doses. Yeah, no, I think that can happen. Yeah. Any other question? Why don't you take a break? We'll be around. You can ask other questions. Give it up for Dr. Amon, everybody.